Cora TV. The world is thinking. My name is Dolan Cummings. I work at the Institute of Ideas. Um, this session is called Turn That Racket Off, um, which is perhaps an unusual idea for a uh, discussion on music. Um, but I, think, I hope it, it will come out uh, with some interesting um, ideas on the question of whether there is just simply too much music and people have forgotten how to listen to it. Um, and more generally, I think that raises questions about how we listen. There, were, there was some discussion this morning about um, how there had been a change in classical music audiences to, to clapping between movements, for example, which was um, frowned on by more traditional audiences. Um, you know, should, so should we be more disciplined in how we listen? Um, should we um, get rid of pipes music and lifts and so on, um, uh, on, on telephone exchanges? Um, and you know, what does all this tell us about, about contemporary music and how contemporary music, in fact, has changed um, and the way that um, composers are starting to think about disorganized noise and, 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 and using noise in other ways. So there's a lot in this um, topic, um, and I'm hoping we can at least uh, stir up some interesting ideas and, and then perhaps take that on uh, uh, in other ways in, in the future. Um, I had considered opening this session with a minute's silence, um, uh, but I decided that was a bit naff. Um, and in any case, um, there has been a move in, in football away from minute silences to minutes applause, um, perhaps because of the assumption being people can't really be silent anyway. So um, I don't want to patronize you in that way. I'm sure you could be silent if we wanted to, but we really must crack on. Um, thanks to, the, to, to the, the Royal College of Music and to the Society for Promotion of New Music for helping us with these sessions. Um, there are listening posts out here which you can, you can uh, listen to in the break that have been produced by the, 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 the SPNM. Um, the particular response for this session has been done by a composer called uh, Katarina Glowicka, um, and it's, it's kind of an exercise in listening, so I, I recommend that. Um, there's also uh, one by Simon Caton, which is responding to this morning's, um, and another dealing with the, uh, the one later this afternoon. So that's um, something to pay attention to. Um, let me introduce the speakers in the order they're going to speak. Um, first, to my immediate right, will be Stuart Sim, who's a professor of critical theory at the University of Sunderland and the author of Manifesto for Silence, Confronting the Politics, of Noise, sorry, confronting the politics and Culture of Noise. Um, next will be Colin Lawson on my left, who's the director of the Royal College of Music and who has an international profile as a period clarinetist and played principal in most of Britain's leading period orchestras. You can hear Colin in action tomorrow at the session. Um, what's the session called, Sarah? What does music mean? Um, Colin will be demonstrating what music means, and there will be a discussion about music and meaning, and in particular politics. Um, so that, that, I think, is um, very exciting. Um, after Colin will be Cecilia Wee, who's on my far right. Um, she's an arts broadcaster on Resonance FM, and a writer on contemporary noted, notated and experimental music. Um, so she comes at this from um, the visual arts world as, as, as well as um, uh, uh, music. Um, after Cecilia is Claudia Molitor, um, to her left who is a composer um, and director of the Soundwaves Festival. Um, Claudia is a participant in the SPNM's 2006-07 Adopt a Composer Scheme. So does that mean, are you still available to be adopted? <laughs> yes, okay, good. Um, and then finally, we'll have Bill Drummond, who many of you will know from his, his work with KLF in a previous life. Um, Bill's an artist and the founder, um, for purposes of this discussion, of No Music Day, um, a five-year plan to promote the debate about ever-shifting relationship with music. So obviously, very well uh, fitted to speak. So um, each um, speaker will speak for five minutes, no more than seven minutes, um, and I'll make as much time as I can for audience discussion. So, Stuart, can you start? Okay, these lines. Yeah. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Right. This will be five minutes or so on the subject of music and silence. I'll quickly summarize where I'm situated in this debate and what my own particular agenda is. I'm the author, as Dolan said, of a recently published book entitled Manifesto for Silence, Confronting the Politics and Culture of Noise. There, I start from the premise that noise pollution is a major problem in today's world and that it's becoming steadily worse. Then I make a case for the virtues of silence, arguing that we need more of it in contemporary society. The use and abuse of music is one of the topics I follow up, and I'll be ending here today with some observations about that. There are simply more sources of noise around each year that are encroaching on the lives of all of us to the detriment of our peace of mind, our health, and even, I argue, our sense of humanity. 
Noise has become an all-pervasive marketing tool, and it has also become a weapon in the form of such products as sonic bullets, which are laser-directed beams of noise pitched at well above the pain threshold that quickly reduce anyone caught in them to the state of gibbering wrecks. Needless to say, the US military is extremely interested in this product as a method of crowd control and of dealing with terrorists. So it does occur to me it might make the terrorist explode the bomb rather than stop. So-called sound bombs are as used extensively by the Israeli Air Force against the Palestinians in recent years are another nasty example of noise as a weapon. They're created by planes flying very low to the ground over built-up areas at over the speed of sound. The result, as you would expect, is a very massive boom that has been reported to cause heart attacks in the civilian population, as well as to inflict severe psychological damage on the very young. I explore a range of such abuses of noise in the early part of the book and then go on to investigate how silence has, has been interpreted throughout history as a concept, theme and symbol and what it has meant to humanity in such areas as religion and the arts. Silence has traditionally been identified with divinity in most of the world's major religions and is also seen as the appropriate state for meditation and even for worship, as in the case of the Quakers. It has been a theme which has inspired many poets and creative artists and is also, I argue, necessary for the process of thought in general. This can become disordered and diffuse if there's too much noise around, which is one of the reasons why it's often used by military forces as a form of torture. Rock music played at ear-splitting levels for hours on end with headphones on you is one of the American military's preferred methods for breaking the resistance of terrorists and enemy captives. So this brings us on to music, the focus of this session. Silence is, of course, a critical aspect of musical composition. Music is as much the organization of silence as it is of sound. The composer John Taverner, for example, speaks of trying to achieve an effect of frozen silence in his works, akin to that that he finds in Byzantine icons, which is one of his major sources of creative inspiration. John Cage's famous, or infamous, I suppose, four minutes, 33 seconds, on the other hand, uses silence to make us aware of the sound that's all around us all the time, even if that's just the noise of people breathing or shuffling in their seats. What I'm critical of in the book, however, is the abuse of music such that it becomes unwanted noise. The use of music as a marketing tool, for example, as in the Muzak that swamps our culture, the inescapable background to shopping malls, airports, and a host of other public places. Perhaps some people actually like Muzak, but many of us would prefer silence. Although what you can say about Muzak is that it's generally very bland and inoffensive. But that's not so with the other abuse I'd like to draw attention to, and that's amplification. Amplified music, which generally means rock and pop, can be extremely aggressive, which of course is part of its brief. That can be defended on aesthetic or even socio-political grounds. But what is insidious about it is, is that it takes over the environment. Outdoor rock concerts can be heard miles away, an oral footprint that forces itself even on the unwilling. I call that a form of aggression, and it's part of a growing aggressiveness in the use of noise in our culture that I think should concern us all. The corporate world has harnessed this aggressiveness for its own purposes in the context of bars, where music is deliberately played at a deafening volume to cut down chat and encourage more alcohol consumption by the creation of a frenzied, overstimulated atmosphere, and the noise level deliberately is pushed up over the course of an evening. Silence has many virtues, and I think it's time we made more space for it and stopped all such corporate attempts to colonize it and exert even more power over us. Perhaps then we could appreciate the music better. Thank you. Thanks for that. Bang on time. Um, Colin. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just move the microphone. Can everybody hear me? Um, yeah. Great. Fantastic. What's a racket? 
Perhaps music that's too loud to bear, or perhaps simply music that's not to our taste. During a recent afternoon at the Lion King in the sixth row of the stalls, I felt physically uncomfortable on both counts. Of all the senses, I feel most vulnerable to intrusive sound, and I'm not embarrassed about wanting to avoid it when I'm shopping or in a restaurant. Unwanted touch and smells I can normally avoid, and I can avert my gaze when necessary. But sound, that most elusive medium within which to teach students, is another matter. Whether I'm the victim of a leaking iPod on the tube or an overloud Bruckner Symphony in the Royal College of Music. I wait with interest the impact on music of the European noise regulations from next April. And silence means so much to me that the RCM's currently about to soundproof the concert hall you'll be visiting tonight at a cost of £3 million. Music surrounds us on a daily basis, but do we have any real understanding of it? In a society that increasingly prizes visual stimulus and instant gratification, music can easily seem peripheral and little more than an ornament. Yet from the Middle Ages to the French Revolution, it lay at the very heart of a general education and was felt to have the capacity to change the lives of listeners as well as performers. One of Mozart's closest associates, son of a shoemaker and a midwife, reckoned that anyone wanting to understand music should know the whole of worldly wisdom and mathematics, poetry, rhetoric, art, and many languages. Conductor Nicolas Arnoncourt has suggested that the French Revolution marked the start of the downgrading of music, prioritizing aesthetic and emotional aspects over vocabulary and syntax. Current debates about the value of commercial classical radio stations revolve around the very question of whether music should be understood or merely absorbed. Of course I don't hate classic FM, but I do want to settle for more than relaxing classics. And I do object to pieces turning into adverts just after I've started listening. In common with literature, there are naturally a huge number of levels on which music can be appreciated, leaving ample scope for the dismissal of others' tastes. The music of 2007 is bound to reflect our own spiritual and emotional lives and so is likely to shock and disturb us. The current sharp divisions of pop and classical music are relatively recent and we classical performers need to act as advocates and move way beyond a narrow, a narrow technical focus. Brahms once said that in order to become a good musician one needed to spend as much time reading books as practising. We must engage and thrill a difficult task when music's constant availability in our lives can paradoxically make it more difficult to appreciate the value of sound and indeed silence. The concept of racket, of course, easily predates recording. It's salutary to remember that in Vienna in the 1860s, supporters of Brahms and Wagner actually fought in the streets over their musical differences. In Paris in 1913, the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring famously ended in a riot. It's difficult for us now to imagine a world without recording when concerts themselves had a different now or never flavour to them. Can you imagine never hearing a note of music unless you were in the presence of someone performing it? Music was not just an oral experience, but a matter of physical presence, social interaction and direct personal communication. But when recording developed in the last decades of the 19th century, many musicians were initially enthusiastic, and Tchaikovsky considered it the most surprising, beautiful, and the most interesting of inventions. Any nostalgic yearning for the days before recording and broadcasting, when everyone in Britain and elsewhere had to rely on their own amateur music resources, is put firmly in its place by Charlotte Haldane in her book Music My Love of 1936. I consider mechanical reproduction a boon and a blessing to mankind. I wholeheartedly approve of the BBC. Radio distortion is currently unsatisfactory, but this is a minor evil compared with the drawing room massacres which sensitive ears had to endure in the days of parties, the invitations to which included the ominous little line, please bring your music. Haldane echoes a moment in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice of 1797 when Mr. Bennett interrupts his daughter Mary at the piano with the words, you have delighted us long enough. <laughs> Professionally as well, a much greater degree of informality was acceptable and even welcomed a hundred years ago when people did not have the perfection of edited recordings as a yardstick. Every concert was different, and so were the musicians. They looked different, they walked differently onto the platform, turned to the audience differently. 
Chrysler greeted them like their favourite uncle, while Rachmaninoff scowled as if the last thing he wanted to do was to play the piano. Early recordings show how diverse things were before the globalisation and homogenisation of styles. Thomas Edison can never have imagined any of this when he first heard himself reciting Mary Had a Little Lamb on his tinfoil machine in 1877. Edison's laboratory attracted a number of distinguished visitors, such as pianist and conductor Hans von Bülow, who recorded a Chopin mazurka and almost fainted when he heard it played back. Records of early singers did something to convince the public that the gramophone was more than a raucous entertainer in rather dubious taste. But the British, at least, were highly suspicious of opera singers, described in 1889 as undoubtedly the most capricious and the most childish representatives of the whole profession, the most injudiciously <coughs> flattered performers of the whole world. One of Caruso's discs, replete with hallmark emotional sob, was played soon after it came out at a demonstration of the gramophone to a group of ladies in a Mayfair drawing room. They made no reaction while it played. There was a long silence at the end until one old lady looked up from her crochet and remarked, it seemed to me that the man was quite hysterical. <laughs> There's clearly then nothing new about sonic intolerance. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Uh, Cecilia. Can you hear me? Do you want to take that? Actually? Oh, um, OK, thanks. Yeah? OK. I'll just set it in here. Before I start, um, I just wanted to say a little bit of a word about John Cage. And um, I guess for anyone who's really interested in the relationship between music and silence in contemporary society, he's really important. Um, his ideas about silence um, and, and music and sound, also about amplification and environments where multiple sounds um, and musical pieces can take place. Um, the first idea that I wanted to start off with is the idea of the sound vector or the sound constellation, um, that our interaction with sound moves through um, a constellation of silence, sounding, um, noise, making sound or receiving sound, um, listening and hearing, sort of differentiating those active and passive things, um, whether sometimes sound is to us environmental, other times it is uh, expressive and that could be somebody expressing or it could be yourself. And I completely agree with um, what Colin said about music the inability for us to turn away from music and sound sometimes. Um, and I always think of Kant's um, quip that music is like perfume, in that sense. Um, and I guess that kind of brings us onto the question of context and the question of use of sound. Um, I think that sound silence um, can be very positive, as um, Stuart sort of says in his, in his book, for contemplation. And I remember being at um, Oxford Circus tube station platform at about 10 o'clock on a weekday night and uh, waiting for a train for about eight minutes and every 15 seconds there were announcements and I, you know, it, we were actually going mad by the time it was like four minutes um, past. Um, sounds can be positive as well though. I mean if anyone sort of thinks of um, car journeys, you know, from it, you know, car journeys of more than two hours without a radio, then you're going to have to try and make up some games or, you know, um, you can turn a completely negative situation within um, your group of travelling buddies into a really positive kind of bonding, let's, let's get there and we're going to get excited about our, our journey and our destination. So I think that it's important to stress the right time for um, music and the right time for um, listening and the right time for sound. Um, we also have to remember that sound is temporal and it is an experience. Um, and in this sense, I think it's important to um, note that we do kind of overuse music and take it for granted, take its um, existence in the world for granted, and also um, the accessibility of it for granted. And that's why, yeah, I really think that Bill's um, New Music Days are interesting idea in highlighting the fact that we sometimes use it too much. Um, going on to the power of music, I think that music is, um, is able to com um, signify in a very complex manner. Um, silence has various functions as well as sound having various functions. Um, 
In terms of this question of aggression of sound, I think that um, I have to disagree. Well, I mean, uh, with with some of what Stuart says about um, rock and, and pop being the only sort of um, aggressively sounding things. Um, I think also that the issue of sound torture is not just about um, the genre of what's being played, but also the repetition and the way that um, armies and um, the military use that repetitiveness and the experience of music rather than just the sound. Um, I think that, um, yeah, just just to sort of say about non, not being specific to genres, um, overbearing decibels do not amount to aggression, do not equate to aggression. Music is a sophisticated system of discourse, um, and you know, there are I. I can talk about how loud, for example, um, Karl Michael von Hauswolf's. Um, sine wave pieces are, or how loud Messian's et expecto um, with its huge gongs are, or I can talk about how loud um, DMZ's iconic um, Barry Du Boy um, dubstep track is. Um, and I think that they all have um, relevant qualities in their place. Um, finally, and this is, I'll, how am I doing for time? You've got a couple of minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, Music's place in society. Um, today in the lunchtime debate, David Beach was talking about autonomy, and I think it's a really important question to bring up um, in terms of music, um, that music is not necessarily engaged with delivering a social aim, but is prophetic in its own language. Um, music is a lot of the time asked to build communities or linked to community building. Um, at the same time, it's also linked to um, isolating various peoples. If you, you know, the, if you think of the sort of typical example of um, people playing their, their iPods really loudly on a bus, etc., etc. Um, music as a consumer product is marketed as if it can solve social ills. And I don't think that that's the role of aesthetics or any cultural production. Um, explicitly, um, and that individuals in society should really take responsibility for the current use of music and the understanding of silence in contemporary society. We've got to think through the development of um, technologies that we're using at the moment. Um, we've got to be more considerate. It's a, more, it's a sort of di deeper issue than just, are we playing our music too loud? It's a question of um, how does how does consideration for other individuals in society affect um, all of these things, like listening, like um, pollution, um, ecological issues, etc. Um, and the last word is, I don't think that there can be any return to innocence of there being less um, noise, as I don't believe that there was necessarily any such thing. And I think it's important not to mythologize a sort of pre-industrial age without amplification and without any of the things that we have available to us now. OK, thanks. Uh, Claudia. <coughs> right, so I thought um, I'd just sort of talk about certain things that really interest me in terms of my work as a composer rather than come up with any grand conclusions about this debate, obviously because nobody can. Um, and you might expect that composers are the kind of people who are the first to um, complain about a lack of attentive listening. But the question is actually a bit more complex because you have to ask yourself, where does this idea of listening properly come from? And you know, who expects it? What is it anyway? Um, I do a lot of listening as a composer in one form or another. And when you actually think about your own listening habits, you realize that you listen differently in different situations. And when I was first thinking about this discussion, I was listening to Radio 3, and I can't remember what I was listening to. I think there was some books to Huda in it somewhere. So you could say this is very, very bad listening, you know, I was totally inattentive. But it actually fulfilled a kind of function, you know, it gave me a sonic canvas on which I could let my thoughts about this 
discussion sort of just meander and form. Um, so what interests me is where does this idea of proper listening come from? And the idea of a concert hall listening is really a 19th century notion. Um, before then, music was always somehow linked to social events. Um, be that, for example, Bach writing music to, in a way, prepare the con congregation to commune with God or worship or whatever they were doing, uh, or Mozart kind of writing music um, for the pursuit of pleasure for a small audience um, that was a private audience. It wasn't even public music at all. And really only with Beethoven was this idea of sitting in the concert hall, attentively listening, and basically create, you know, divorcing music from, from society in a way, creating absolute music. And that was a, a new thing that happened in the 19th century. Um, what I think has happened since then is that a sort of mythologization of art music has taken place, um, where we've created an imaginary past where people used to sit down and in, listen to music. And although that kind of happened for some people, for a very small group of people in one particular genre in a very short period of time, if you look at music's history and all the various different musics around, it's actually a tiny percentage. And so the problem is that we use this imaginary past as a yardstick for what is listening properly now. So we're expecting people to listen in a way to music that they've never really listened to. Um, and then the question comes along, of course, do composers and sound artists nowadays expect their audiences to listen to music in such a way? And I think the answer is um, yes and no and maybe, because I think most composers and sound artists are aware, aware that this listening intently is a myth. And so we do, we do write music with this in mind, so you get installations which allow people to move in and out of a sonic experience, or people trying to break up the concert hall situation with, with other media and other ways of engaging with music. Um, the other thing, of course, is that it's always difficult as a composer or sound artist to think, well, what is a meaningful way of engaging in music? Because that's very personal. And, and you can't really say, this is the right way, this is meaningful, and this other way of engaging with music isn't. And of course, I want, my, uh, you want audience to engage with my music, but I don't have control over how they do it, just as little as a writer has control over how their book is read. I mean, you might be reading the book in front of a gentle fire, or on the tube, or on the toilet, or you might be using the, the book as an aid to fall asleep, or you might be making notes in the margins. And all of that is kind of good. So, so on the one hand, you have this criticism of too much, uh, of people not listening properly, which I obviously disagree because of the link with it, with mythologization, and also it is connected to a canon. And on the other hand, you have this idea of um, us being bombarded with noise and music and sound. And I sort of agree with that, but I have to qualify that because I'm really, really partial to noise. Um, I think, as Cecilia said as well, noise defines our environment and it, it gives it space even without you looking at it. And noise can be really exciting and exhilarating and, yeah, at times quite infuriating. Um, and I don't actually have an iPod for that reason because I really enjoy listening to noise. Um, sometimes I use earplugs for train announcements and things like that. But also, as a composer, you often create your pieces whilst you're actually just on the train or walking about or doing things. And if you had music, others' music playing in your head, you couldn't really sort of think about all these sounds that you are trying to put together. But anyway, so the question is, when does sound become noise that we can't tolerate? 
and that's obviously very very personal but for me it's got to do with the intention of it so noise that just happens because of actions around is okay but when it's placed there intentionally to grab your attention whether that's music or car alarms or or um tunnel announcements then it becomes really grating and it becomes an infringement into your um your space so in a way someone playing some awful music on a mobile phone i don't actually think that's a musical question that's a social question um, and it's got to do with <coughs> wanting to create a bubble in a crowded space and doing that you know whether you're doing that with sitting with your legs that far apart when you're on the train or whether you're sort of sonically making yourself a bubble but it's a social thing and it's 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 not a musical um, issue what does infuriate me is this idea of, of music you know using music um, for just one purpose, and that's to sell. And you could argue, of course, that's a social thing, selling things. But I think somehow I find what I find so wonderful about music and art and science and philosophy and everything is because you could argue it's inessential for life, and that makes it such a wonderful endeavor, you know, a human endeavor that y you can go beyond just trying to feed yourself, not that food, I mean food is actually very important as well, <laughs> I haven't thought that through, <laughs> but, but I think you know what I mean, that you know, music is somehow more, and, and I don't like it being used for selling, but that's probably my personal sensitivities. Okay, thanks for that, um, and finally, Bill. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, this November the 21st is going to be the third No Music Day. And to celebrate No Music Day this year, BBC Radio Scotland are going to embrace it and not play any music throughout their day. So that's, so that's over two, two million listeners are going to be exposed to it, have to put up with it. And that means there's going to be no jingles coming up to the hour on the news programmes. On the jazz programme that evening, they're going to have to delve into the BBC archive for interviews with the greats of jazz over the years. On the folk music programme that night, it's going to be, yet again, delving into the, uh, the BBC archive for um, storytellers from the Highlands and Islands and other parts of Scotland. Now, as I said, it's three years old. There is only going to be five No Music Days. And I want to briefly tell you how I got to the point of wanting to have a No Music Day. At some point in the early, about 2001, 2002, sometime, or maybe even 2000, sometime around then, I became aware that I was having a problem with music. I expected music, I expected to find music that would open a door into my, in my head, into a room that I had never been into before. And over the years, over the decades, that I'd continually found different music that would do that for me. But I was finding that wasn't happening anymore. And I didn't want to accept I was becoming jaded. I didn't want to be one of these people that somehow thought the music of their youth was better than the music of today, or the music of 200 years ago was somehow better. than. I, I thought it was me that had the problem. And it is me that has the problem. And my initial way of dealing with this was to uh, decide that from now on, or at that point, whenever it was in the early 2000s, that I was only going to listen to new music. Not new music as in a genre of contemporary classical music, but new music, music that, is, uh, that has been made by people that have never made music before. And this is their first, if I'm listening to a piece of recording, this is their first CD or a download. And, and I am listening to it, it within 12 months of it being recorded. And in that way, it dispensed with that whole thing of all that old music. And each Sunday, I'd get the Sunday papers, get to the cultural section, get to the reviews, and I wouldn't want to know what the critic had to say. I wouldn't want to know how many stars they'd given the album. I just wanted to know if that was a new ensemble, composer, band, soloist, whatever. And I'd put a tick beside it. On the Monday, I'd be going down the record shop and, and get... Now, I wasn't getting all the things. Yeah, I wasn't getting... But enough. And 
The trouble was, and this is the jaded bit creeping in, I'd be getting a CD back home, I'd be all excited, I'd be putting it on thinking, but that just sounds like something I heard 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, but I kept it up. I kept it up for almost, uh, almost 12 months. But something, I was in my workroom, I got all my old CDs there, and something got the better of me. And I got one of my old CDs out, something from my, from my youth. Put it on, and I was thinking, what an idiot I've been. You know, this is fantastic. I have stopped myself listening to this. And I put another thing on that. I won't go into what that music was, but both of those acts, composers, began with B. So I decided I'm going to rethink my listening. For the next 12 months, I'm only going to listen to composers, ensembles, uh, uh, bands, acts, solos, whose name or surname begins with a B. <laughs> and, and it seemed brilliant, you know, Bartok, Beethoven, Bach, Big Bill, Brunzi, Count Basie, Badfinger, The Beatles, you know, the Backstreet Boys. It just seemed, I, I, and if I don't listen, if I do not hear the whole of the, um, uh, of Bach's, well-tempered clavichord this year. I may never get to listen to it. I, I, and it really gave a vitality to it. Now, I imagined I was going to be, and I might never live long enough to get to the bees again, because I was imagining I was going to spend the next 27, 26 years going the way through the alphabet. <laughs> but come towards the end of my time, I kept on thinking about all the C's. So then I dropped in a random element into this, which was, I wrote down all the letters of the alphabet, minus B, on a piece of paper, tore them up, put them into a Morrison's bag. Now, it wasn't Morrison's then, it was Safeway's bag. <laughs> Safeway's bag, pulled out the next letter, it was P. Now, I'm on my fifth, I'm on E this year. And it has been, uh, it, it has given a real whatever to, to, to the listening. But it, it hasn't totally worked. I have to admit, you know, I have got a bit blind, and I get think up ways around it. Like if somebody, if I get into, the, into my Land Rover and there's a colleague of mine who works with me on things and I let him decide what goes on, you know, he can plug his iPod in and he's Mr. DJ. So I get round it and, you know, there's always, so I cheat. So I was going to give you that angle. Also, about the same time with this kind of jaded listening thing, I was thinking, what would it be like if I didn't hear any music for 12 months? None whatsoever. And then you heard music again. And going back to that thing that some of the others have talked about, you know, before the era of recorded music, you had to go out of your way to hear music, maybe in church on a Sunday or, or on a dance on a Saturday night, or, or you know, you could play or you get somebody else around that could play in, in, in the parlour. Uh, but I was thinking, wouldn't it be fantastic to not hear it for t 12 months and then hear? I thought, well, that's not going to happen. I, you know, that's, as we've been pointing out, that's not a reality. And I got it down to a month. Could I do a month? Could that be possible? Couldn't do it. So I decided upon a week. And this, this was going over a few, you know, a couple of, two or three years, this thinking. A week. So I, I tried to do a week, starting on Monday morning. Now, I have a family. I have, you know, it's very... I didn't get further than Tuesday. You know, it just didn't... It was not possible. And at that point, I thought, okay, one day, I'll do... And, you know, the, the, the world is littered with days for this, that, and the other, all, you know, good causes. I thought, well, I'll have a no music day, you know, that, that's it. And I knew it was kind of, and I don't want to use the word ironic or postmodern or whatever here, but there was an element of irony. Obviously, not postmodern, because I'd be using it in the wrong terms, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I, so, I decided to have a no music day, and it was just going to be a personal thing. I thought, well, which day shall I have of, of the 365 on offer? Now, I remembered learning at some point that St. Cecilia was uh, the patron saint of music. So I thought, well, have no music day on the day before St. Cecilia's day. To work in the same way as having um, Halloween on the day before All Saints or uh, Mardi Gras before Lent kicks in. So sort of in that sort of way. So, St. Cecilia's Day is on the 22nd of November, so I thought, no music day, 21st of November, so I can not listen to any music at all, and then enjoy it on the 22nd with more something. So as I said, it's been three years now, I've been, uh, the first year, it was a personal thing, last year, 
I got a website going, I put a very, very simple website, two questions on it. I will be observing No Music Day because, and then people can answer, I will be observing No Music Day by, and people can answer. Put this website, and it seemed to, well, it did attract tens of thousands of people. I touched a nerve, not for all the same reasons that I was coming from, for all, and lots of people thinking it's completely stupid. I have it on my five minutes now. Just about. Just wrap it up now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was, I, at some point, I think in the past few months, I decided I'd make it a five year thing, that I didn't want to be sort of hauling this thing out forever, uh, that I can just see, to do it for five years. If anybody else wants to take it on, they can feel free, but I'm doing my five years of it. That's it. Okay, Thank thanks. Thanks for yes. the time. Okay, well, I think all those hung together better than I'd expected, so that's good. Um, so um, I'll come pretty much straight out. I just wanted to draw out two things. Um, one is the general idea that I mean, there's a bit of consensus that silence is valuable, um, and that's obviously disputable. I mean, you are allowed to dispute that. Um, is it that, that we've lost a sense of the value of silence if we ever had it? Should we start valuing silence? Or is there something, um, is that about cutting yourself off from the serendipity of, of everyday noise? Is there something to be said for just being exposed to, to other noises? Um, and then I suppose particularly, is one of the reasons to value silence because of proper listening, this issue that came up in a, a couple of points. And, and to continue from the discussion this morning, it was about universalism in music. The question was, is it really an important or a good thing for music to be universal in some intellectual sense? So do we want to preserve this idea of listening whether it's in the kind of um, 19th century classical idea or even sitting down and listening to, 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 to rock records or, or, or even dance music, whatever you happen to be into, you know, is that something to be valued or is it kind of snobbish and ephemeral? So you can take that on. Um, just, I think also the, going back to the first point actually, the, the, the idea about um, noise, where it's annoying and where it's something to be celebrated and enjoyed. With Claudia, there's this idea of intention and I remember reading something by a forgotten who is a novelist talking about how he could write in the house and if there was noise outside roadworks or whatever, anything that he couldn't control, he was fine with it. He would just ignore it. But if his kids were noisy, he'd be furious and he'd go and shut them up. And it seems to me there's something quite telling there. There's about how much control we have over something. That if you feel you could make more silence, if you've got no control over it, it's easy to accept. And that maybe is a thing about the you know, people um, playing music on, on buses or whatever, it gets into that tension. Because on one hand, you can say, well, I'm not doing it. I should just tolerate it. It's beyond me. And then you think, well, maybe I should challenge them. Uh, maybe I should, you know, be a good citizen and tell them to shut up. Um, and I think that what's really annoying there is that tension within yourself, almost, how you respond to silence. So that's just um, my perspective on that, which I think is um, people might want to respond to. But anyway, is silence valuable? Should we try and protect it? And why? Is it important that we listen properly to music, or is that just um, old-fashioned? Okay, there's a couple of microphones around. There's a man, there's uh, Ed from SPNM at the back, and then the woman at the side here. Hi. Um, first of all, with apologies to Aretha Franklin, I think, first of all, we're talking about R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Um, respect for ourselves, respect for other people in our environment, um, and respect for the sounds themselves. I mean, two anecdotes, first of all. One, um, the composer Louis Spohr in 1805 playing to um, an aristocratic gathering um, told not to play too loud by the Duchess, who was busy playing cards, not wanting to be disturbed. Um, Rossini, um, in an opera of 1812, writing the Sherbet aria, um, the aria for uh, a lesser soloist to play basically whilst the patrons of the opera house are too busy enjoying themselves and weren't really going to listen to the music in any case. So I think there's the idea of respecting music and respecting sound has uh, quite a long history. Um, in, from my own experience, I'm very interested in the way in which increasingly um, a lot of um, musicians and bands, um, certainly working outside of a concert hall tradition, want to play within spaces that are designed for listening. Um, uh, ourselves, we're putting on a series starting at the Luminaire um, in Kilburn, in a, starting next Wednesday. And it, one of the reasons why that's one time out venue of the year and is a great space is precisely because um, they tell the audience in no uncertain terms that if you go there to have a drink and chat with your mates while the music's on, you're in the wrong place. Get lost. Um, 
I think the, uh, the one question I've got for the panel is, do you feel that there is any um, uh, irony in pieces like Music for Airport by Brian Eno, or the idea that, that Eno brings of creating music so that you can think, um, so that you, in, in some respects, so that you can have this very um, uh, peaceful environment in which other, other music or other noise is shut out so that you can think for yourself? That's my question. Okay, thanks. Don't answer that yet. I'll take a, a few people and then. Um, there's a woman over here and then at the front. Um, very fascinating thought. Thoughts come to me. One is that silence enables you to be an individual. I feel that there's a crisis. Many people feel that they don't have much individuality. It's obliterated by communications or a kind of conformity. And that business of silence is such a precious thing because the habit of it can bring thoughts into your mind and you can almost reclaim yourself as a person. And I think it is utterly vital. I'm not saying that there isn't a place also for what you said people think about things while there's a kind of sound background, that's another thing. But I think silence is precious. And I also think that the respect that is shown to music that's written with that in mind, that you go into a concert hall, you take the trouble to go there, you give your full attention, actually enhances an experience. And as a performer, those of us who are performers know that the sense of people giving their full attention to a piece of music lifts the whole thing onto a completely different plane. There is an intensity and there's something inexpressibly precious in that which cannot happen if people are nattering or shifting around or coming and going. And I, I think we would lose that at our peril. Whatever else we do, we should keep it. Thanks. Yeah, the main noise I think I've been hearing around this room so far has been the noise of individual axes being ground. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I've got my own uh, axes, and I'm very fond of them. You know, when I see a, 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 I hear a, a mobile being played in a bus, I generally approach the culprit and say in an extremely loud voice, was that really the best you could afford? And that usually has quite a salutary effect. Um, however, no, the, the, the thing that I think is being missed here is... is um, uh, 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 the idea that uh, 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 noise is barbaric, it's philistine, and it's completely uncivilized to tolerate that. Uh, and are we going to speak out in defense of civilization, a civilization which we know is in decline, uh, uh, and is really, uh, in, in terms of music, as I said in a previous uh, uh, thing, has, has finished? It's, it's all over, you know, the, 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 world's, the world's only great art music happened over a few hundred years and is now history. Uh, and we're in the business of curating the legacy that's left behind by that. We're not in the business of creating great masterpieces in music. We're, we're interested in creating great music. Yeah, great, isn't it great? But the idea of great music is completely off, off, uh, off the map. It's... it's uh, you know, it's forgotten. I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Okay, it seems appropriate to go to Simon Caton, who's a composer next. <laughs> There's three together there, actually. If you, if you all come in and then I'll take the panel and then I'll go back out. Does this work? It doesn't. Oh, no, it does. Um, it, I've, it seems that most of the panel agree that um, noise is somehow uh, more an issue of being uh, socially or politically defined than defined by decibels or the actual quality of sound. It's a case of whether it's being imposed on you or whether you're choosing to hear something. Um, I'm just interested because um, I don't know if you know uh, the writings of Jack Atterley, um, who talks, who's got his book, Noise, Political Economy. He seems to define things the other way around, whereas he sees silence as being something that's politically imposed and noise is your ability to speak. And it seems to me that there's a kind of a dialectical relationship between noise and silence in that the more we get to... Um, to make our own noise, the more we're all silenced. And it says something sort of about individualism in general. I don't know if anyone's got any comments on that. Okay, and then we'll next year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Okay. Uh, I want to make some comments on what was said about the um, political, uh, ecological, and social um, place of music. I think it's very, very important to, to put that in the context of political context, social context, uh, ecological context. It's difficult to, to separate them. Um, I think it's a question of, of defining the place and your own space and um, where is the, sp the space of, um, where is your space in relation to the other space? And uh, there I join what you said, um, the person at the back on respect, respecting the, the space of the other is very, very important. Um, and then this feeling of being invaded, one space is invaded by too much, too much noise. Um, another thing I want to say, the importance of silence, um, being a composer, I, I value very much the, the um, place of um, the ability to, to refer to my musical memory. The musical memory is so important. Um, and um, to have that space to reflect, to think, to think in terms of your, in, of your music. And um, that's very vital. And I feel that when we're invaded so much by our exterior sound, we lose that memory, that capacity to memorize. Um, it, it goes away. We don't trust it anymore. Um, the third point I want to make is regarding the abuse of music, in, in, um, which uh, uh, Simon Stuart Sim mentioned. Um, I think the most awful example I can think of the abuse of classical music is, as you mentioned um, in Israel, the sonic bombs. In certain Israeli prisons, um, the Palestinian prisoners are forced to listen to Beethoven at really terrible, terrible levels of volume. It's just excruciating. And of course, there's this cultural clash too, because you know, Beethoven means nothing. It's like, it would be, and I think, I think that's the most awful um, use of classical music um, that I can think of. Okay, thanks. Katerina, do you have your hand up? Um, also, I will we'll also speak from the perspective of the composer, um, just some thoughts. Uh, one about silence. As a composer, I use, uh, tend to use silence as a uh, means to build tension. And in some of my pieces, uh, especially this one piece in which I uh, deliberately put about 25 seconds of uh, silence, and I increasingly come to the situation when conductors tell me, no, no, we have to cut it because they are not going to bear it. And it actually happens that um, the piece gets performed each year uh, with shorter and shorter silences because the, the conductors would tell me, uh, no, no, 20, 20 is going to be enough, 15 is going to be enough. You know, it gets shorter and shorter. So I'm just uh, wondering how, uh, how short it's going to be at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll come back and take responses from the panel before it um, takes some more um Colin, do you want to pick up particularly on this idea of listening? I, I thought yeah, I think it's, I mean, it is a very interesting one. I, one of the most interesting sentences I've enjoyed so far was your introduction, actually, when you said that uh, audiences are beginning to clap between movements, because that's exactly what Mozart would have expected 200 years ago, which actually, I mean, uh, I, I think backs up what Claudia was saying. I mean, you've got to be very careful about the way you use history, I think, mm. in, in defining these things. And I, there's not much else I want to say, except that the, the session for me has been spoiled, certainly, by the amount of racket out there. <laughs> Um, Cecilia, do you want to come on? Um, any, any particular thing? Or? Yeah, I just wanted to... Um, oh, there's so many points here that I've written down and, and I'm not quite sure where to go. Um, I think that um, th this gentleman in the front, the idea about noise being barbaric and um, sort of val trying to revalidate, I suppose, um, great art music... Um, I think I notice that you have a. I can see that you have an ISM. In, oh, yeah. um, in, sorry, what? I can't actually remember what ISM stands for. Incorporated Society for Musicians um, newsletter there. And yeah, I completely understand that sort of stance that classical music um, needs to, in a way, reiterate its existence. Um, however, I think that there are. Um, it is important to to ensure that there's the other voices are heard um, and it's I think I think trying to um, trying to say that classical trying to go back to that idea that classical music must be the only great music now 
um, is, some, is, is in some way regressive. Um, the idea that noise is barbaric, I think that you really need to, um, or we in a, as a society really need to redefine what noise means. Um, and I actually am not that clear myself. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know if it's clear, but I think um, mostly noise is used as something that is negative. But really, any sound emanating accidentally can, could be described as noise. And, and all that music really is, and all that composition is, is organisation of different noises and the silences between them, or the silences and the noises between them, I mean, however you want to look at it. Um, and, and of course it also is very cultural what sound is seen as beautiful and what sound is not seen as beautiful because their music, um, I, when I was teaching some students and I was playing them Japanese North Theatre which is very, very old classical Japanese music they were turning their no noses up at it and saying this isn't music, this sounds awful so, you know, and the same as you were saying you know, playing Beethoven to people who aren't, aren't culturally, you know, uh, been brought up with that it might just sound like a total mess and over the top so you know we have to be a bit sensitive to um, other people's aesthetic attitudes as well and what I wanted to just say about what you're saying Brian Eno's kind of um, soundscape thing I mean interestingly now because of the iPod that's what everybody's doing you know <laughs> creating their little personal soundscape and I, I can sort of understand that but you you are by doing that, you're kind of shutting yourself away from interaction with other people and, and you're shutting yourself away from hearing quite interesting things. And if you do, and I, I love walking through London and hearing the sounds and, you know, someone shouting there and something happening there and building works there. It's a fantastic cacophony. And if you don't think of it as, oh my God, it's so noisy, but actually sort of really let yourself enjoy it and let yourself enjoy it as, as, as a sonic, you know, as a living sonic installation, just think of it like that, then actually it becomes rather beautiful. And then you start no noticing things and you start noticing... For example, birdsong. It's incredible if you walk through London how much birdsong you can actually hear. If you only attune yourself to it and don't sort of say, oh, it's just all noise and block it out. Okay, so, uh, can I ask you, so, I mean, respond to anything you want, but in particular, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if, you, if you meant that, that, um, that kind of amplified music in terms of the genre is more problematic than anything else, but aren't you being quite rigid in your distinction between if you take this question of intention, because, you know, the sea can be very loud, the wind can be very loud, birds could be annoying if you get in the wrong frame of mind, I suppose. So isn't it more relative than that? Or do you think that there is something quite particular? Well, there's something quite particular. Natural noise you cannot do very much about. Uh, noise that is humanly created, you can. That becomes noise pollution, and you, you can actually do something with that. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm picking up here, and I'm guilty of it myself, is that noise is a polemical term. And what is noise to me might be sound and, and interesting and fun to you. But the point that was being raised about how do you define noise, you can define it physically. Over a certain level of decibels, I think it's about 80 or so, you enter into a pain threshold. If you get far enough, you start to do physical damage, not just to your... Uh, your hearing, but to other organs of your body, so it can be defined. Uh, rock concerts have been rated as high as 150 decibels, which is miles above anything that actually does physical damage to your, your tissue. So you can define it that way. Uh, but I was in interested in the point that was made about the use of silence in music and how difficult it is to get either an audience or even the players to, to use this. Uh, something that's not fully realized is how important silence is in all forms of communication. Speech theorists will tell you there's a grammar of silence and equally you can use this grammar of silence in music and it's I extremely critical in the theater. The longer you can hold a pause in certain plays, the more response you'll get from the audience. And the point that you made, that it's a way of building up tension, is is, is absolutely critical and there is a grammar about that and if it gets compressed we'll lose the sense of that so I think that's aesthetically a very interesting point I don't, I don't think it's anything to do with genre noise I think it's to do with decibel level and over a certain decibel level even Beethoven isn't going to sound interesting and he'll probably do you physical damage
Okay, Cecilia, did you want to respond? Um, yeah, I just wanted to come back on a little point there. Um, actually, don't worry. I'll right. that later. <laughs> okay, um, Bill, you can respond to whatever you want again, but uh, expose in particular, are you worried about other noise other than music? Because obviously there's a particular problem with music if you're interested in listening to music. Um, do you think that silence more generally is something that, that concerns you? I mean, or is it specifically being exposed to music that you see as being problematic, which suggests a, a, that it comes from a care of, about music rather than silence? I've got, I've got something I wanted to say in my head. No, 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 say that. Sorry, I'll ask you again. Uh, so I'll come to that in a, a second, sure. okay? I know, I, I've spent most of my life in the countryside. So I, I'm, I, 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 so I haven't been bombarded with uh, the, the sounds of the cities in the same way as maybe some of the, the rest of you have. In this. But I find all sound pretty exciting. You know, I do, even, I'm now living in London and have done for just the past year and I've never lived in London before in my life. And I live, uh, there's buses, there's a bus stop right outside my door, a, a night bus. And I still love the sound of the, the, the doors opening. And they, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they make this e type sound. And I think, oh, there it is again. Yeah, it's great. And, and I do, I can't stop myself liking all sorts of And, you know, the bird sound that I didn't, I thought, you know, and bird song has been a huge part of my life. Ever since I can remember, bird song has been a big part of my life. And I thought I wasn't going to hear bird song in London, but I'm exposed to it, maybe not all the time. But it's there, you know, if you want to go on the traditional beautiful bird song thing. But, but the other thing I was going to say, I mean, I hate, and I've experienced it twice this week, one in a bar, crowded, and then there was this music even louder. So that's what we're, you know, one of the cliched things, you know, and you can't talk. And, and then I, I, I went for a, a, a tea, coffee in the tea in the, the National, National Gallery um, restaurant earlier in the week. And they've got this piano music in the background, and I hated that. No. But I know that I can have, I get, you know, all sorts of stuff on my hard drive at home that I could be listening to, and I've, all my favourite stuff is all there. But if I'm walking down the street and I hear a piece of music coming out of a shop, and it's some, and it can make me think, that is fantastic. That is absolutely... And it can hit you in a way, and you just only hear a bit of it, and it's not in a good condition, and I'm not properly listening to it, but it emotionally affects me in a positive way far more than if I'd actually sat down at home, chosen that thing off my hard drive, and listened to it in front of my good speakers, and I, and I know there's, a, there's, so there's a, that sort of other opposite argument. And I'm not pro-Muzak. Uh, I'm not pro... But I know that sometimes when you accidentally hear a piece and you only hear a fraction of it, it can trigger off all sorts of things in your head and it's in a really positive way. Even if it's on the call waiting thing and, and suddenly you're hearing some, you know, trashy Mozart that's only about that size and you're thinking, oh yeah, I forgot about this piece. And, and, and it can have an effect. What's it like after half a dozen times going through? While you're of waiting? course, look, we all get incensed, but I'm just, I'm, I'm actually just saying there is another side to that accidental music, and it's too easy, too easy to, 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 to rubbish it. Yeah. And it's also this, what I sort of dislike is this idea that, um, of controlling, you know, yeah. controlling what people can, what noises people can make and what sounds people can make. And, and as you said over there about this idea that silence is actually quite, um, can be used as government control. And I think that's, that's true. And we, we should also not forget to delight in all these things Absolutely. that can just Absolutely. by chance come across. And by controlling our environment too much and disallowing too many things to happen, then these things that like you said couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And that would be very sad. And it's the mixing, hearing, hearing, accidentally hearing a piece of music, mm -hmm. could be any kind of genre, mixed in with the sound of the bus going past, or exactly. the, the, the birds of the rain, and, 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 and that, that is, I'm lost for words now, but you're constructing your own composition as you walk along. You're making and, and you take, yeah. yeah. And that's a very exciting thing, and I don't think most people open themselves up to that. Mm. Can I just add one thing to that? That's all very well. 
except under a 24-7 kind of framework. Uh, one of the examples I used in the book of what I think is a dreadful thing to happen, in Shanghai, there's now 24-hour construction that's been licensed in order to put up all these skyscrapers. How would you like to live opposite that 24 hours a day? No, the problem with silence and noise is you want some kind of balance between them, not a continual bombardment. Okay, um, Colin, and then I'm going to come back to the audience because um, I know people are keen to come out. So, um, well, thanks very much. I mean, I, I did like the point over here, particularly about um, silence and, and being an individual, which seems to me to be very, very important. I mean, I've had one thing taken away from me in the last year that seemed very important. I used to be able to sort of run around tube stations and reflect on the previous day. And what's happened now is there are endless announcements, you know, about, um, I don't know, keeping your luggage um, next to you and, and, uh, and all this kind of stuff and what the state of the network is at the moment. For me, that's one of the most important things that's been taken away, actually, mm. because, I mean, reflecting um, as well as respecting seems to me to be very important. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, there's um, Neil Davenport will be speaking <laughs> this afternoon, um, just at the front here. Um, then, next to him, the woman in front, and then the man over here. I'll try and get everyone up. Okay. Um, a very enjoyable discussion this afternoon, but it, it kind of got me thinking. I think it's not so much that there's, there's, there's too, much, too much music, it's more the case that music uh, today appears divorced from any historical context or any kind of context where why do things outside of music actually appear important. So if you look at um, Mozart, that was an expression of the, of, of the Enlightenment. Experimental pop in the 1960s was an, was an expression of the um, newfound experimentation in that period, um, early 1980s, post-punk was kind of driven by the confrontational nature of that society. And it seems to me that music becomes, appears to have more valuable, it appears to engage us more when it's, part, when it's wrapped up in something very potent in society. Now, I have a lot of friends that are, I, I can't really keep up with, with today's bands, it all sounds the same from um, you know, when I was younger and all the rest of it, as, as, as Bill Drummond's already um, pointed out. I think that might be true, but what really um, inspires people in relation to music is, is when you'll get a piece of music or you'll get uh, a particular band who manage to capture something wider in society. And, and that's when abandoned music can actually appear quite exciting. It's not just music in and of itself, although you can't deny uh, the importance of that. But music becomes memorable when, it, when it's kind of not crudely shaped, but when it, when it just appears to capture a zeitgeist, when it, when it, when it a, a appears to be part of something that's very potent. And that means that our engagement with music is equally impotent. I mean, is, is equally potent. So I think today, if, if people have an, have an irritation with the, their too much music, it's really their irritation that they are also alienated from society. So music appears to, to kind of confront us in the way that engagement with society also appears uh, uh, to confront us as well, or, or the engagement society appear, appears, uh, appears alien. In that spirit, I, I really do agree with what Bill Drummond is saying, is that in certain contexts, music can take on a different interpretation, it can take on a different life, precisely because it's in, in a social context, if you, if you like, or it's in a context uh, in, in the outside world. Um, so I, I think when, when examining music, it's, it's not just of it in and of itself, but it, it usually takes on a greater resonance when there's something wider potent that it represents. Okay, uh, next. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if um, anyone agrees that there seems to me to be an increasing um, in, uh, intolerance to noise in the public sphere and whether um, that is growing in relation to a, an increasing intolerance of mass society that, that fills public space. Um, if you compare, I think there's been a bit of a shift, if you compare the sort of modernist celebration, and in fact people like Bill and this lady here were also celebrating the symphony of the city, you know, in literature and music, that, that happened in that era. But today, uh, there's, there's more talk of noise pollution and ASBOs, you know, that have been slapped on the violinists in Manchester. Um, you know, it seems the increasing intolerance is related to an attitude to, to actually to mass society. Okay, and then in front, thanks. I'd just like to comment that I think some of the irritation factor and the amount of music that we're exposed to now is, uh, is the fact that most of it is pre-recorded and as such has become as wallpaper. A wonderful example of this that I experienced a few years ago is uh, I had builders in and they turned their transistor radio on at the start of the day and it was twiddling away in the background all day and nearly drove me demented. A week later I had kitchen fitters in 
Um, they didn't bring a transistor radio, but one of them sang all day all, for a whole week, and I haven't enjoyed myself so much forever. But it's because it was a personal statement and not just wallpaper. So I had to take issue a little bit about... The, um, about what you were saying earlier about um, recorded music, you know, good recorded music being perhaps more acceptable than second-rate um, live performance. I don't think that was quite the point. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think this is part of the irritation factor now is that there's too much wallpaper. Okay, thanks, Is that man over here? And keep, keep, keep the hands up so I can get out. Sounds cool. Yeah. Hello. Well, I'm standing very close to the door so that I can escape very quickly. Um, I was sitting in Starbucks and somebody sent me a short message system about this. My name is John Groves. I come from Hamburg in Germany. And I'm responsible possibly for a lot of what you may term a sound pollution, which you'll find uh, around you here in England and in a few other countries, because we operate in, in quite a few countries. And we're responsible for the sound of airlines and for various brands. Lots of jingles that you probably hate. Uh, but there's a lot of positive to be said for the kind of orientation that we supply and also the communication of various attributes and also on some trains and things the information that we can provide are useful to some people but we're very aware uh, that we're not dealing with a homogenous group when we deal with humans that there's always going to be different needs so we're very very open and I'm not talking just for my company I'm talking for uh, the, the whole business of people that are responsible for shaping uh, this situation and who do have a responsibility, who, who do have kids as well and are not just uh, making the quick buck here and are very interested in hearing views and points how one can create and the gentleman used the word balance and as everything in life there is a, a balance and to be able to have respect for private spheres and perhaps as in some trains in Germany to actually have a mobile telephone free zones, an announcement free zone so that one is free to choose and on our websites we always include the off button so this, for this freedom is there. I have an awful lot more to say, but I won't bore you. I'll say my name one more time. You can perhaps read about me on Google. John Groves, G-R-O-V-E-S. And I would very, very much appreciate if somebody would take the initiative to set up some kind of platform that we can have an exchange of this views, because then it will remove it just from a, a, a talk amongst ourselves to something actually that the people are, who uh, have the power to influence this can actually maybe implement some of the... Uh, the, the, the opinions that come in. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. stick around. I'm sure people will want to talk to you in the break. <laughs> okay. Okay. There, are, there are two women in the row in front um, in red and purple, in either order. And then a, a few hands at the back. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something about the control um, issue to do with music and silence. Um, I've um, had an ongoing battle with the um, swimming pool, the health club that I go to against the ubiquitous capital radio everywhere. When I go in early in the morning to have a swim, I actually don't want to be bombarded with capital radio. It's what I'm there to get away from by my teenage daughters. Um, so it, to me, going for a swim is my haven. I, I can think my own thoughts. I don't want capital radio um, interrupting those thoughts. And my, the comment when I, when I mentioned this, to, when I mentioned this to them is, well, you know, sometimes it's a little bit quiet in here in the morning. It's a little bit, you know, dead and, and you know, the, the, the idea that you always have to have music all the time in every situation seems to me quite odd. And the control then is coming from the people who are um, producing the musical background to my attempted um, thinking for myself and my own thoughts. So I think it's another way of looking at, at control and who's controlling the environment. So f for me, control is coming from the people who are um, imposing capital radio on me when I don't particularly want to. Okay, thanks for that. And the woman next to you, and then back. I, I think we're in danger of losing our sense of humour as a nation. And I think that um, silence can both create humour um, and create an atmosphere. And yet music can do that too. It can change us so, so markedly. And I'd love to, an to answer with a little humour your p earlier question about um, shortening um, your pieces and recall a, a brief incident in um, a church where there was a rededication of an organ. Um, the church was full of all the local dignitaries and the vicar came, came out to thank the organist at the end of this recital. And he said, yes, yes, that was really rather good. Of course, one must always remember that the mind can only take in 
what the bottom can endure. <laughs> like, with the man with the microphone, and then two right at the back. Okay, um, it all working? I'm uh, a noise musician, so I do uh, like a good racket. Um, but I also like silence. Um, a time and a place for everything. But I just wanted to back up what the lady over there was saying, um, that uh, sometimes the criticism of, of uh, noise and the desire for personal silence um, can be a bit selfish, I think. And uh, we often hear uh, pe the people who listen to their Walkmans loudly on the tube and so on described as uh, th creating their own bubbles. So I think about wanting to have uh, total control over your, uh, the, your environment can also be about putting yourself into a bubble and divorcing yourself from other people. And um, really, noise is a by byproduct of um, human activity. And I get the sense that sometimes people who criticise noise don't like human activity and maybe don't like people very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Thanks for that. Um, can people keep yeah. their points as short as they can so I can get in as many. There's a man here, then there, then more. Um, yeah, for now. We bring back the panel. <laughs> Can I, can I just say how relieved I was to hear one voice raised in favour of Muzak? If you'll let me explain, I, I'm, I'm a secondary school head teacher, obviously not a very good one, because I allowed the introduction of Muzak into the school dining hall. Uh, I seem to remember the Lion King actually figured quite prominently. Um, what we observed was that the behaviour, the social behaviour in the school dining hall, improved markedly and dramatically. Now obviously that doesn't matter now because we now have a healthy eating regime and there aren't any pupils in the school dining hall. <laughs> but, but should the occasion ever arise again, I'd be interested in, in the panel's comments on the, the trade-off between leading my pupils to the moral high ground and plunging them into the aesthetic abyss. Thanks, that's very helpful. Um, the other side of the... Uh, Ali? Hi. Um, my name is Toner Quinn, I run a magazine, a music magazine in Ireland, and interestingly enough, this issue came up as well. And it came up in 2003 when an article was written, it was called Silence by Sound, and the, I just want to recall a few of the points he made, uh, this writer. The first thing was that he noted an increase in the volume of Irish society as wealth increased in the 1990s. And this was something that a lot of musicians and composers had noticed as well. That was the first point. Um, the second point he made was that increasingly, and I think all your anecdotes have actually proved this, the only people who are going to be able to attain silence are those who have more money than others. It is a, it is a political issue now. All of these issues here where you um, illustrated uh, noise, annoyance, they can all be solved by money. And he made the point that more and more those who have money will be able to attain silence, those who don't, won't. Okay, thanks. And there's uh, Ivan Hewitt, oh, oh, you, and then Ivan Hewitt, thanks. and then Mark Vernon, who's at the back. But go, can I just go. ask, Bill, does the no. Uh, no Music Day actually work? Do you wake up on St. Cecilia's Day with a kind of reinvigorated sense of of your kind of ability to appreciate new music as well as the old music that we, we all know and, and love because it reminds us of our the friends that we had in our youth. I think the new music will always be fighting an uphill struggle against that. Okay, uh, thanks. And Ivan Hewitt's behind there, and then Mark Vernon, a couple of people along. Yeah, I had I experienced this little twinge of fellow feeling with about what Bill said because I, you know, I too, as I you know, I feel the years creep upon me. Uh, sometimes notice a certain jaded feeling coming along, you know, I, perhaps my, my appetite for music isn't as keen now as it always was. And I think, um, I think, I wonder whether part of the trouble may not lie in a completely different area, not so much to do with noise and silence, as, as to do with the, the ideology we're surrounded with, that we have to be, we have a kind of moral obligation to be receptive to everything. There's a kind of jargon term for this, isn't there? It's called having an open mind. And um, we're supposed to have this all the time. And if you don't, if you say, actually, I don't, really don't want to hear that, that's a kind of black mark, isn't it? You know, you, you really ought to be attending to everything. You should be, Bill, you should be listening to all those albums you read about in the Culture Supplement. And I think in the end it produces a kind of... One becomes like a spring that's been stretched once too often. You know, you, you just lose your spring. So I... I, I Personally, I've, my, my solution to this has been to go to slightly fewer concerts and say about certain quite considerable large areas of music, don't want to know. 
can't relate to it, haven't got the time or, or, or the personal energy to, to engage with it. I mean, so a philosopher, Michael Tanner, once said very wisely, I thought, one can only love a certain number of things, a small number of things. Okay, thanks for that. And then Mark Warren. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about a friend of mine, or someone I know rather, who's um, a Cistercian monk, and um, he is a master of silence, you might say. He, he, he lives his life in silence and sometimes moves to noise rather than perhaps what we've all been talking about, which is living in noise and trying to search out some silence from time to time. And uh, I think one of the things which you would say is that silence has intrinsic value. Um, for him, it would be uh, divine, uh, listening to the still small voice of God and so on. Um, and I just wonder whether perhaps part of the problem is that we, we don't have a sense of what the intrinsic value of silence might be. When the composer that was talking about her 25 seconds being reduced to 20 and 15, even that serves to build the tension. Maybe part of the problem there is that we don't know quite what it might be of itself. Um, and when I've been listening to other people's accounts of, uh, of silence, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, I've been trying to hear some intrinsic sense of silence. So the, the woman over there who talked about uh, silence and individuality, silence and, the, and being a self and so on, was perhaps getting towards that. But my, my, my friend Cistercian Monk, uh, living in silence, has been occurring to me. Okay, thanks. We're going to come back to the panel. And I'm sorry to people who can't, can't get in, um, but if we overrun, the noise outside will become unbearable. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to ask if each panellist, um, no more than two minutes I'm afraid, to really come out with any final remarks, ideas about maybe where we should take the discussion forward, because obviously we're not going to resolve anything. The one thing it seems to me is that, the, the, that perhaps there's a consensus that silence is a good thing, that too much noise can be a bad thing. But the one other point I would make is that much of the time I'm not really talking about music. Some of this discussion is going away from where I've been in the book. <laughs> I'm looking at how silence has been used over a range of activities and what it has meant. Most of the problem with noise is socio-political and socio-economic, and it's the marketization of noise more than anything, the colonization of public space by that for market purposes that I'm really against. Uh, I'm all in favor of the serendipitous uh, findings that you might get walking through a city, although I wouldn't care to walk through Shanghai at the moment. Um, thanks. Well, I mean, I've enjoyed the discussion particularly about the relationship of music and society and where we are, because I think, we, you know, that uh, we have actually divorced one from the other in, in various ways. But I'd like to build on what Ivan said, actually, and, and, and go on to say that I think a lot of musicians, certainly in the classical arena, are themselves jaded, as uh, the need to characterise music, which used to be the old thing, you know, if you listen to discs of 1900. Um, we're so frightened now by the sort of techni technical expertise that the digital age has brought upon us, we're almost too frightened to make music at all. And I think that's a very good reason for Ivan actually becoming jaded at concerts because people aren't actually giving it a damn good swing, even in the classical arena. And I mean, that, I think, has been a bit of a downside of the digital age. I won't say any more. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, thanks, Ivan, for that point. I completely agree in some ways um, that I... I can't possibly listen to every single thing that um, is, is thrown at me, is suggested to me, and also um, I don't necessarily want to, and you know, we all feel the pressure, if you want to be successful in contemporary society, to be completely omnivorous, and um, I, I kind of resent that actually, um, but at the same time as a critic, then I wish that you would like more music, um, <laughs> or, or try and go to more music. Um, on a note about... Um, uh, technology I think is really important um, that yeah we do kind of question where technology leads us but at the same time you know technologies are um, made by humans and everything as somebody said around here um, is made by humans therefore we have to um, look at the consequences for this um, about the, the gentleman who, who said something about um, using the Lion King in his school, I personally find that really <coughs> offensive. I um, really hope that nobody I know has to go through that experience um, because I object to being manipulated um, by such things. And I think that's, that's the problem um, of music in society at the moment, that a lot of the time it's being used for manipulation. Um, I suppose as a composer, I really, really love sound, and I really love noise, and I really lo love silence, you know, and, um, and I really like to be surprised by either silence or sound or noise or whatever, and that sort of gives me inspiration for um, my work. But I, I can completely understand how it gets irritating, and what 
actually I find more irritating is not sounds, is not noise, it's more what you said before, the, the sort of announcements or this kind of, this trying to guide you into something, to manipulate you into a certain way of behaving and that can be done by sound and in a way sort of playing music to school children, okay I can see why that might be a good thing to do because you can, it'll be easier and you get nicer um, behaviour but I find that just extremely problematic to control people's behaviour. Even if the outcome is positive, in a way, I still don't like it because so easily could it switch into a negative way of using it. But that's, again, political. Thanks. And last word to Bill. Um, I use churches, and there are churches in walking distance from near enough where everybody lives. A lot of churches are still open. Now, obviously, a church in the middle of Shanghai isn't going to be a quiet place, uh, but they are generally quiet places that you can go to and use, and you don't have to be religious. So if you're wanting some silence, and if you can create that time in your life, there can be silence there. That's one thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is that, um, which is maybe the introduction of another whole thing, but I'm just going to lay it out. I perceive recorded music as a very 20th century thing. Whatever genre of music it is, once it's recorded and once you're listening to it, you're listening to it in a very two-dimensional way. And where we're now at, we're at the tail end of recorded music as the creative front. That, uh, of course, recorded music is going to carry on. You know, you can't uninvent things. But there's going to be... And I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> No more to be said. Um, <laughs> the next session's on education, sort of, um, but it's all over, so we're done.